and welcome to section 11.8 where we're going to talk about muscles of the pectoral girdle and the upper limb. So first we'll start off with our anterior thoracic muscles. First up we have our pectoralis minor muscle. This will be found deep to pectoralis major and this muscle is going to help to depress and also protract the scapula. So it helps to kind of hunch your shoulders or round your shoulders out. Next we have the serratus anterior muscle and this has a fan shape to it um, between our ribs and scapula and it's called serratus because it is like a serrated saw jumping up on each of the ribs. This muscle is going to upwardly rotate the scapula so it, in order to do that we also protract the scapula and it stabilizes it as well. Next we have the subclavius muscle and that is this tiny muscle over here that is extending from the clavicle over to the first rib and this helps to stabilize and depress the clavicle. Now let's take a view of our posterior thoracic muscles. We have our levator scapulae muscle here and this is attaching to the cervical vertebrae and the scapula, specifically on that medial border above the spine. And so when it contracts, we're taking this insertion closer to the origin and we will elevate the scapula and we can inferiorly rotate the scapula as well. Then our rhomboid major and minor muscles are going to run inferior laterally from the vertebrae to the scapula and we find this deep to this trapezius muscle. Our rhomboid muscles are gonna to help to elevate, retract, and inferiorly rotate the scapula. And then we have our trapezius. Our trapezius, of course, is going to look the same on both sides. So when you put them together, you get that diamond shape or kite-shaped muscle that is extending from the skull and the vertebral column to our pectoral girdle. This is going to allow it to elevate, depress, retract, or even rotate the scapula. And here are some of those retraction and protraction movements of the scapula. Here we have our scapula retracted when we have good posture. I know I'm slumped over right now. I'm going to fix my posture. I hope you do the same too. And then here we're going to see our retractor muscles, trapezius and rhomboids at work. Whereas our muscles that help to protract would be our pectoralis minor and the serratus anterior. So this is what we hopefully don't look like when we are sitting at our computers or standing up with this poor posture and protracted scapulae. And here are some other motions of our, our actions of our scapula. We have elevation in which we are bringing that scapula up. Our muscles that assist with that are rhomboid major and minor and levator scapulae and trapezius, just the superior portion, and our depressors are going to bring that scapula down. So that would include our trapezius muscle and pectoralis minor, which of course would be in the anterior view. And then here we can see our superior and inferior rotation of the scapula. So here we have our serratus anterior muscle and trapezius that are rotating the scapula superiorly so that we can raise that arm up high. And then here we have inferior rotation taking place where our rhomboids major, minor, and levator scapulae would contract in order to cause that rotation. Now we're gonna talk about some of the muscles that move the arm at our glenohumeral joint. We'll have 11 muscles that cross this joint and help to move the humerus. So we'll start with our agonists or prime movers of our glenohumeral joint our uh, latissimus dorsi muscle, which we find in this posterior view on the lower back. It is a broad muscle that has a triangular shape to it, and it inserts onto that intertubercular uh, sulcus on the humerus. And the fibers, when they contract, they're gonna cause arm extension and also adduction and medial rotation of the arm at the shoulder. Another muscle is gonna be our pectoralis major muscle. This is our thick fan-shaped muscle on the superior anterior aspect of the thorax. And it is going to reach on over and insert itself onto the humerus and will cause arm flexion 
an adduction and medial rotation of the arm, just like our latissimus dorsi. And now for our triceps brachii, which we find on the posterior arm, our long head, which you can see pictured over here more um, in detail, is going to originate from the scapula. And so we're crossing the shoulder joint here, whereas the long head and the medial head will originate on the humerus itself. But together, they are all going to insert onto the olecranon process here. And when it contracts, we will extend the arm and have a little bit of adduction because of that long head. Now, we're going to touch upon the actions of the lateral head and medial head, but most of you already know that it's going to help to extend the forearm. And now for our biceps brachii, both of our heads are originating on the scapula, as we pointed out before. So it is crossing our shoulder joint, and it is going to cross our elbow joint as well. So it's going to assist in flexing our arm. And um, once we talk about the forearm, we know that it too is going to flex the forearm as well as supinate. And then we have our deltoid muscle over here. This is going to be the prime AB ductor of the arm. Its anterior fibers will help flex and medially rotate the arm. Its lateral fibers, or sometimes we can call this the middle deltoid, is going to help to abduct the arm. And then we don't have a posterior view here, but the posterior fibers would extend and laterally rotate the arm. And if we were to peel away the biceps brachii, we would get a better view of this coracobrachialis muscle. This is going to flex and adduct the arm. Next, we have our teres major, which we see in this posterior view of our muscles. And if we look at the scapula here, you could see that teres major is originating in that inferior angle of the scapula and will insert onto the humerus. And when its fibers contract, it will extend, adduct, and medially rotate the arm. And now for our rotator cuff muscles. First, we'll talk about subscapularis. That we could see from this anterior view of the scapula. Of course, our thoracic cavity has been removed here, as well as the serratus anterior that would normally sit um, anterior to this subscapularis muscle. And this muscle is reaching over and inserting onto that lesser tubercle here. So when it contracts, it is going to medially rotate the humerus. Next, we have on our posterior view of the scapula, our supraspinatus muscle. And you could see this pictured over here as well. All of the rest of the rotator cuff muscles are going to reach on over and insert into the greater tubercle here. So our su supraspinatus coming from above, inserting there, is going to allow for abduction of the arm. Then we have your infraspinatus. Sorry about that. Your infraspinatus and your teres minor that are both going to laterally rotate the arm and do some adduction. And our rotator cuff muscles, our subscapularis is going to help wind up for the pinch because we have that medial rotation going on. Our supraspinatus is going to help in executing that pitch delivery because of the abduction there. And then our infraspinatus and teres minor are going to work to slow that arm at the end of the pitch, basically doing the opposite of our subscapularis with the lateral rotation. And here is a clinical view on rotator cuff injuries. They're typically going to develop because of some type of trauma or disease, and it can be caused by repetitive use in most cases. It could be caused by also falling on the shoulder or lifting something too heavy. Um, and our supraspinatus is the one that's the most commonly affected. We can have symptoms of swelling, tenderness, and pain with movement. You really won't see a huge change in how the shoulder looks, but you could do a couple tests on your patient in order to figure out what is going on. So while I'm not going to be testing you on any of these tests that you can do on rotator cuff injuries, I think they're really interesting to learn about. So first we have your pain provocation test, and this is going to be the painful arc test um, is another name for it. 
So the first thing you have your patient do is stand with their limb by their side, and then you bring that patient to full abduction. And as they do this, you want them to describe at what point they start feeling a pain. So if they have pain, shoulder pain between 60 degrees and 120 degrees, then that means that they have a subacromial or rotator cuff disorder. Another test you could do is a strength test. So you would do an internal rotation lag test um, in order to see if the subscapularis muscle is affected. And what you're going to do is have the um, hand on the side that has been bothering the patient to place it um, kind of lifted off their back. And the patient is then asked to keep that position. So if that patient cannot keep their hand out in that way, then that's a positive test and we know that we have an issue with the subscapularis muscle. The other test you could do is a external rotation lag test and this is gonna test for our supraspinatus and infraspinatus and you will have um, the examiner rotate that patient's arm into a full external rotation. So you are moving that forearm out um, and away from the body and make sure that the patient is not assisting with that external or lateral rotation. And if the patient cannot keep their arm out in this external rotation position, then that means that they have an issue going on with their supraspinatus and their infraspinatus muscles. Now let's talk about this drop arm test, testing the supraspinatus muscle specifically. The patient is going to lower their arm from this transverse position back down to their side. So if the patient just cannot hold their arm up in the abductic position, then we know that there's an issue with the supraspinatus muscle. So the patient's arm would just kind of drop to the side. Um, and of course, we would have some pain associated with that. And lastly, we can talk about this composite test where we do an external rotation resistance test to test that infraspinatus muscle specifically. So with the patient's arm kind of flexed in this position, 90 degree type of flexion, the examiner is going to push, push the hand and tells the patient to resist the examiner pushing against it. So essentially you're trying to get that patient to do an external or lateral type of rotation against resistance. And if that patient is feeling pain or weakness while they're trying to do that, then that is a positive test and we've got a tear of some sort or damage to the infraspinatus muscle. And so we're gonna see this most commonly within the baseball players. And for treatment, they will go through physical therapy or a surgical repair. Now let's move into the arm and forearm muscles in which we will see movements at the elbow joint. Our limbs are going to be organized into compartments. So this is a cross section taken from the arm. And we could see that there is deep fascia in here to subdivide each of these muscles and compartments and this is called intermuscular septa, septa referring or meaning wall. And so we're gonna have a compartment that is gonna house these functionally related muscles. First, we have our anterior compartment over here where we will have blood vessels. Here you can see the brachial artery and of course we're gonna have a branch that comes off that is the deep brachial artery. We're gonna have innervation of these anterior muscles by the musculocutaneous nerve to the biceps and brachialis and corcobrachialis is not pictured here, but it too is innervated by musculocutaneous. And then we have our posterior compartment over here, which has our extensor muscles. So this is gonna be supplied by our deep brachial artery once again, and we will ha we'll have innervation by the radial nerve, which you see pictured here. And these are the three heads of our triceps brachii. We will start with the anterior compartment first. We have our biceps brachii muscle here, which is our two-headed muscle on this anterior humerus. And this muscle is going to flex and supinate our forearm 
It is a weak flexor of the humerus, which might be surprising to most of you. Whereas our brachialis, which is deep to our biceps brachii, is actually our most powerful flexor of the forearm. And then we also have our brachioradialis, which I don't have pictured here, but let me bring one up. There we go. So this is a posterior view, or sorry, anterior view of your forearm. And here's your brachioradialis. So it kind of wraps itself around. It actually um, originates from that supracondylar ridge on the lateral side of the humerus and then extends on down the lateral side of your forearm. So if you are sitting at a desk, if you were to kind of have your forearm mid, like in between pronation and supination, so your thumbs are kind of pointing up, and if you tried to lift up your desk, I'm like trying to do it right now, <laughs> you would get your brachioradialis muscle to kind of pop out um, and definitely have a lot of tension within it. And it's that's because it's going to be involved in elbow flexion, but that position is where we're going to get that, uh, a lot of tension within that muscle. And then we have your posterior arm compartment, which we know consists of your triceps brachii. And this is going to have those three heads on there and it's going to be a major extensor of our forearm, but it helps to extend the humerus as well, like we talked about in um, previous slides. So we also have this little tiny muscle here. It's triangular shaped known as anconius. This is actually known as the fourth head of the triceps brachii and is a weak elbow um, extensor. And it's going to cross the posterior lateral region of the elbow. Now let's talk about some of the muscles that pronate or supinate your forearm. It's nice because these muscles have the name pronate or supinate in it, so you'll always know what action they do. First, in this anterior view, we have the pronator teres muscle, and we have down here in the wrist region your pronator quadratus muscle. This I like to call your wrist sweatband muscle because that's what it looks like. And these muscles are going to help to rotate the radius across, so you can see pronation taking place over here. Um, so that rotation is taking place across the ulna. So here is our radius crossing over the ulna bone, and it's located within this anterior uh, compartment. Your supinator muscle, this is a really cool muscle, it's like a superhero in itself, is going to help to supinate the forearm. So it will be located in the posterior compartment, but you can see how it has this really cool way of wrapping around the radius so that when this muscle contracts, it kind of pulls the radius off of the ulna and places the forearm back in supination. A little clinical view on lateral epicondylitis. This is also known as tennis elbow, which is not the same thing as golfer's elbow. That has to do with the medial epicondyle. So back to our tennis elbow. This typically takes place from trauma or overuse of common extensor tendons on our posterior forearm muscles. So you can see here, this is the posterior forearm, and all of these extensor muscles are originating here at this lateral epicondyle. And so you might start to experience, experience some pain at this lateral epicondyle where the tendon is attaching. And it often is going to re result from repeated force contraction of our forearm extensors. You would have your extensors over here, and the site of pain is here in the elbow on that um, lateral area. Now let's move into our forearm. These forearm muscles are extrinsic to our wrist and hand. And just like we saw in the arm, which is pictured over here, here's our cross section of the forearm. And we can see we have intramuscular septa partitioning the muscles into anterior and posterior compartments as well. So this here is anterior compartment. Generally, we're going to see that the muscles here are going to flex the wrist, and some are going to flex at the interphalangeal joint. So if you don't remember what that joint is, I place this picture in here for you. 
that is going to be basically in between the uh, phalanx, in between the phalanges. Um, these are called dip and pip because this is, dip is for the distal interphalangeal joint and pip is for the proximal interphalangeal joint. Of course, we won't be going into that type of detail though. Just wanted to point that out. Um, most of these anterior compartment muscles too are going to originate from that medial epicondyle of the humerus. Whereas in our posterior compartment, we will see, oh, and I forgot, I placed this picture here for you to see that attachment of these anterior compartment muscles originating from the medial epicondyle, whereas the posterior extensor muscles are originating from that lateral epicondyle like we saw in the previous slide. And some of these muscles, instead of just extending at the wrist, they're also going to cause some extension at the metacarpophalangeal joints, which will take place between the metacarpal bones and the proximal phalanges. And also we can have extension in the dip and pip regions as well. Something that's really unique in the wrist region and also we have this occurring in the ankle as well are these retinacula. What we need, mean by retinacula is that we've got fibrous bands, um, in this case in the wrist, that are formed from the deep fascia. And it helps to hold the tendons close to the bone so that they're not like floppy and going all over the place. So first in this anterior view, we can see this flexor retinaculum, and this is covering the palmar surface of our carpal bones. And sometimes, Actually, before I get into that, because I forgot, I have a slide on a clinical view on this, but let's talk about how this flexor retinaculum forms the carpal tunnel. This is going to become a tight space between our carpal bones and the flexor retinaculum here. And in between those areas, we will have the flexor tendons passing through in order to insert themselves onto our um, bones in the hand here. And of course, you could see that median nerve would move through the carpal tunnel as well. If we look at a posterior view of the wrist, we can see this extensor retinaculum. This is superficial to the dorsal surface of our carpal bones, and our extensor tendons, like you see pictured here, are going to pass underneath it in order to insert onto the digits. So here we are. I wanted to talk about the carpal tunnel syndrome ahead in the previous slide, but I had to wait until we made it to the slide. So let me orientate you in this illustration here. Here are our carpal bones, and then here is our flexor retinaculum. And we have nine tendons passing through this carpal tunnel here, along with the median nerve. And we're going to talk about these muscles um, which are digitora muscles, so they're going to the digits, and then we have one of them that is going to go to the thumb. So we'll talk about these muscles in just a little bit. So this is just the carpal tunnel, but when we have a tightness or some type of inflammation going on in here, that is going to cause compression of this median nerve, which results in a syndrome. We're gonna see that this syndrome is characterized by pain, of pins and needles within this specific area of the hand. So this is a Palmer view. You take that fourth digit and split it in half and basically the median nerve supplies all of the skin in this area of the palm. And in the dorsal surface or the posterior view of the hand, it really just does the fingertip region of digits one through, I'm gonna say four and a half because it's only half of this fourth digit, which is strange, but so true. And so if we're compressing this median nerve, then that median nerve can't give supply to a thinner muscle group, which is the bulk of muscle right underneath your thumb. And that results in thenar atro atrophy, which we can see pictured over here. Um, and that, by the way, I forgot to mention that pins and needles uh, feeling in the hand is called paresthesia. And so the way that they would repair this is they would go in and there's another ligament here known as the transverse carpal ligament. So they cut through that in order to get a little bit of a release so there isn't so much tightness in that carpal tunnel um, so that median nerve can start 
becoming more efficient and innervating the skin and the muscles. Now let's take a look at the muscles in the anterior forearm. We are going to break down the anterior forearm into three layers. So first will be our superficial layer, then an intermediate layer, and then a deep layer. So as I mentioned before, our flexor muscles are going to originate from the medial epicondyle, and we call this the common flexor tendon where they originate from. And the first one we'll talk about is this flexor carpi radialis muscle. So you can see it is headed toward that radial bone region on the lateral side of the forearm. And if we break this name down, flexor, we know it's going to flex. Carpi refers to the wrist. And radialis, you want to think abduct. It's going to abduct. This says the hand. I like to say the wrist, but it really, I guess it is the hand. It is going to make your thumb move closer to the radius. So we can also call this radial deviation. And then in the center of the anterior forearm, we have this slender muscle known as palmaris longus. And it is going to be missing in about 15 to 20% of the population. So a good way to know if you have this muscle is if you flex your wrist. And then I want you to, so let's say you are flexing your right wrist. Take your left hand and push your fist away from you. So you're creating some resistance. And you should see a tendon right in the middle of your wrist pop out. If you do see that tendon, that is palmaris longus. If you don't see a tendon there, then you fall into that 15 to 20 percent uh, population that does not have this muscle. And this is a weak uh, wrist flexor, so it's not a big deal if you are missing this muscle. And another cool thing is that this tendon then inserts into this palmar aponeurosis, and you can see that in the cadaver view here what that aponeurosis looks like. Next, we have your flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. So this muscle, once again, if we break the name down, flexor means it's going to flex, carpi means wrist, and ulnaris means that it is going to adduct the hand at the wrist. And we can also call this ulnar deviation. Now let's move into our intermediate layer. We are still going to have that attachment at the medial epicondyle. And um, this muscle here is your flexor digitorum superficialis. It's the only muscle in this intermediate layer. And its four tendons here are going to attach distally to the middle phalanges from digits two through five. So naturally, its action is going to have to do with our digits. It can also flex the wrist, and it really does this because we have those tendons um, being held down. And um, we are going to have that metacarpophalangeal joint and proximal interphalangeal joints of digits two through five being flexed. So it really is helping to kind of pull those fingers in. And then we have your deep layer here where we have your flexor pollicis longus. Pollicis always refers to the thumb. So flexors, flexor pollicis, flexus thumb is what we want to think of. We're attaching to the distal phalanx of the thumb here. So it's really helping to flex at the metacarpophalangeal joint and the interphalangeal joint here of the thumb. And this is a weak flexor of the wrist. And then we have your flexor digitorum profundus muscle here. This we can find deep to the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle, which is why we have the term profundus in there because that means deep. And its four tendons are going to go all the way to the distal phalanges here of our digits two through five. So this is also going to help flex the wrist. We're going to flex at that metacarpophalangeal joint and our hip and dip joints. So that again is our uh, proximal interphalangeal joint and distal interphalangeal joint for fingers two through five. And this is a cool little trick in remembering how these muscles are laid out on the anterior form, at least for the superficial layer. That pronator teres muscle that we talked about earlier, that too is going to be included in our superficial layer. So we have that muscle first. 
And then our flexor carpi radialis would extend on down over here. Palmaris longus extends over here toward that palmar aponeurosis, and flexor carpi ulnaris extends on that medial side of the forearm. And one quick mention, the pronator um, quadratus that we talked about as well, that is going to be found in the deep layer of the anterior forearm. Okay, now let's move into the forearm's posterior compartment. We are only going to have two layers here, a superficial layer and a deep layer. And before I forget to mention it, I want to say that the brachioradialis muscle that we already discussed can be found in this superficial layer. And you could see it right over here. Um, all of our extensor muscles here are going to um, attach here at the common extensor tendon at the lateral epicondyle and then we'll start off with our extensor carpi radialis longus. We also have an extensor carpi radialis brevis. Both of these are going to extend the wrist and abduct the hand. Again that word radialis is in here so we need to know that it's going to abduct. Next, we have your extensor digitorum, and if you follow this muscle distally, you could see that it's going to have four tendons extending out, and they are inserting into the distal phalanges of fingers two through five, and they are going to help to extend the wrist, extend those metacarpophalangeal joints, and our dip and, sorry, pip and dip joints of fingers two through five. Continuing on with our superficial layer, the next muscle we will find is our extensor digiti minimi. And this is going to, careful it's not mini-me, it's minimi. Um, and it's kind of funny because this muscle is responsible for extending the little finger. So kind of the move that mini-me does in the Austin Powers movie. This is attaching to the distal phalanx of finger five or the pinky. Now our last muscle here is going to be the extensor carpi ulnaris. This is going to have distal attachment on the fifth metacarpal bone, and it's going to assist in extending the wrist and adducting the hand. Now let's move into the deep layer of the forearm, in the posterior compartment that is. And first I need to mention really quickly that the supinator muscle is also included within this deep layer. And the first muscle we'll learn about here is our abductor pollicis longus. Breaking down its name, we know it's going to abduct the thumb. Next, we have your extensor pollicis brevis, which means we do have a longus coming up. This is going to help extend the thumb at the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. Now, our extensor pollicis longus muscle, that is also going to extend our thumb but it's going to extend it at that metacarpophalangeal joint and the interphalangeal joint. And lastly, we have the extensor indices, which is headed toward the second digit or the index finger, and this is going to extend digit number two at the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint and pip and dip. Now for the intrinsic muscles of the hand, I want you to keep in mind anything in green is not going to be tested. So I won't be testing you on these muscles and their actions, but I do want you to know that our intrinsic muscles of the hands um, are going to have both proximal and distal attachments in the hand, whereas the extrinsic muscles of the hand, they were extending into the forearm, right? And so I just want you to gather and know the um, the name of the group of these muscles here. So here's our thenar muscles. This is forming that fleshy mass at the base of our thumb. And then here we have our hypothenar muscles, which is the fleshy mass at the base of the little finger. And we have this mid palmer group. I just want you to have an idea of where you're going to find each of these muscles listed here. So we're going to find these muscles between the thenar and the hypothenar group. First, we have our lumbricals, which mean little worm or they're worm shaped. Um, and they really do. When you see these in the cadaver lab, they're like little squiggly worms laying in here. And then we have your 
dorsal interossei, which we are going to see right over here. There's our first dorsal interossei, and then we have your second, your third, and your fourth. You have four of these here. And your palmar interossei, you are going to find these in more of an anterior view of the um, hand. So these lumbar coals would kind of move out of the way in order for you to see them, and you'll find them in between the metacarpals, kind of the way you would find these dorsal interossei here.